Hello students. I am sure you are taking good care of yourself amidst the spike in COVID-19 cases. I am Dr. Seema Singh and you are watching me on my channel Bonding with Chemistry. In today's video, we will continue with the chapter Carbon and its Compounds wherein I will take up a small topic Allotropes of Carbon. Well my dear students, this topic is provided in the more to know section of your NCRT textbooks. These are the list of topics that I have covered in my previous videos. The links to whom are provided in the description box below. In my next video, we will learn why carbon forms millions of compounds. That is the versatile nature of carbon. So do please subscribe to my channel and ring in the bell icon for receiving the latest notifications. Now before we learn about the allotropes of carbon, it is necessary that we understand what exactly do we mean by the words allotropes and allotropy? Well, the term allotrope is derived from two Greek words allos, which means other or variation, and tropos, which means manner or form. So, in simple terms, we can say allotropes are different variations or different forms of the same element. Coming to the definition of allotrope, we say allotrope refers to two or more forms of a chemical element that occurs in the same physical state that is solid, liquid or gaseous state. Thus we can say allotropes of an element need to have the same physical state yet different structural modifications. We will understand what the structural modification means in a short while. The concept of allotropes was originally proposed by Swedish scientist Johns Jacob Berzelius in the year 1841. An important thing that you need to remember is that the term allotrope is used only for chemical elements, not compounds. Well, a simple question that crosses our mind is, why does an element exist in different forms? The answer is hidden in two words which I used a little while ago, structural modifications. The different forms of the same element arise due to different ways in which atoms are bonded or linked together. That is, allotropes have different arrangement of atoms. They have different structures. So now when we know the definition of the word allotropes, let's move on to the next word allotropy. The property or the ability of some elements. See, not all elements exist as allotropes. So the property of some elements to exist in two or more different forms in the same physical state is known as allotropy or allotropism. Now when we have acquainted ourselves with the literal meaning of allotrope and allotropy, let us understand them in greater detail by taking example of carbon. Well to begin with, carbon exists in two forms, one as crystalline solids and the other amorphous solids. For your level, the term crystalline solid means a solid which has a regular geometry. By regular geometry, I mean a definite shape, whereas the word amorphous means shapeless. A solid that has no definite geometry or a definite shape is known as amorphous solid. Don't worry students, you will be studying more about them in the chapter, the solid state in your higher classes. Well-known example of crystalline solids are graphite, diamond and relatively recently discovered fullerenes. Whereas some of the examples of amorphous solids are coal, coke, charcoal, carbon black etc. In this video of mine, we will concentrate only on these three crystalline allotropes of carbon as per your syllabus provided in NCRT textbooks. As already stated, these three allotropic forms of carbon differ in the way the carbon atoms are arranged or bonded to each other. Due to different arrangement of carbon atoms, these allotropes differ in the physical properties. But as they are all made up of only carbon atoms, they show similar chemical properties. So remember, allotropes differ in their physical properties but have almost similar chemical properties. Let us now take each of these allotropes in detail beginning with graphite. I am sure you all know that your pencil leads are made up of graphite 
Also, we have learned in my earlier videos that graphite is an example of a non-metal which is a good conductor of electricity, unlike other non-metals which are poor conductors. Let us understand why so. For that, we need to know the arrangement of carbon atoms in graphite. That is, we need to know the structure of graphite. Graphite has a giant covalent structure. A part of that structure is shown in this figure. Here, each carbon atom is bonded to three other carbon atoms. Let us say I take this carbon atom, I am circling this. So, this carbon atom is attached to or bonded to three other carbon atoms. This is one, here two and here you can see three. Similarly, if I circle this carbon atom number two, so it is attached to this carbon, one, here two and here three. So, I repeat each carbon atom in a graphite is bonded to three other carbon atoms in the same plane forming hexagonal array. So you can see this hexagon here. So if I take only the hexagon in red, we see that this is one hexagonal array. In this structure of graphite, I have shown three hexagonal layers or three hexagonal array. The one in red, number one, the one in blue, number two, and the third one in green. Students, please note that these hexagonal array or the individual layer are known as graphene. G-R-A-P-H-E-N-E. -E. You will be studying about it in your higher classes. So this red layer is graphene, even this blue layer is called graphene and the green one is also called as graphene. And the graphite structure is formed by these hexagonal layers or hexagonal rings or graphene layer stacked one above the other. Well, you might argue or think that each carbon atom should form four bonds because carbon has four valence electron because electronic configuration is 2,4. So since it has four valence electron, it should form four bonds. Very true. One of the bonds formed by this carbon is a double bond. Actually, for your class level, the sole purpose of this diagram is to give you an idea of arrangement of atoms in graphite rather than the actual bonding. But still, I'll try to explain. If you look at this carbon atom, it is going to have one double bond here, right? Similarly, let me draw like this for each carbon atom. This one is having a double bond. This one is having a double bond here. This one here, all right? This one again here, this one here, and this one here. This double bond is formed in order to satisfy the valency of carbon. And you will be studying in your higher classes that this is known as a pi bond. Now this pi bond will be formed by two electrons, one contributed by this carbon atom and the other contributed by this carbon atom. This fourth electron in each carbon atom is delocalized. Now what does delocalized mean? For your level, it means that you can't pinpoint its exact position. It no longer belongs to a particular carbon atom, but it is free to wander throughout these graphene layer. You will learn in higher classes the resonance where you will see that these bonds are delocalized. So since pi bond is formed by these electrons, so these electrons are free to move or wander throughout these graphene sheets. Don't worry, you don't have to remember any of these as far as your current level is concerned. But what you need to remember is due to these free electrons or delocalized electrons, graphite, although a non-metal, is a good conductor of electricity. Because I've already told you in my previous videos, to conduct electricity, either you should have free ions or free electrons. Since each carbon atom in graphite has one free electron, it is a good conductor of electricity. So an important question from the structure of graphite is, why graphite, unlike other non-metals, is a good conductor of electricity? Another important question from here is, why is graphite used as a lubricant? Or what makes graphite soft and slippery? The answer again lies in the structure of graphite. Until now, I have told you that these are individual layers, hexagonal layers that are stacked over each other and each carbon atom in graphite has one free electron, let's say like this and so on. Similarly, in this layer also, each carbon atom has one free electrons which can wander throughout these layers. 
Now, what you need to remember is that there is no direct contact between these delocalized electrons of one sheet. This is one sheet and this is the second graphene sheet. So there is no direct contact between the free electrons of one sheet and those of the neighboring sheets. So the question that comes to our mind is how are these sheets then held together? Well, the sheets are held together by weak van der Waal forces of attraction. Now, what are these van der Waal forces of attraction for your level? You just need to remember that they are weak forces. They are not very strong forces like ionic bond or covalent bond. Due to these forces being weak, the layers in graphite can slide past each other. You can see here, they can move left and right. They are not fixed and this accounts for the slippery nature of graphite or its use in lubricant products such as grease. Let us now move on to another common allotrope of carbon known as diamond, the hardest known natural substance. Diamond also just like graphite has gigantic structure. Here in this figure you are seeing just a small part of it. Each carbon atom, if I take this center one as a carbon atom, it forms a tetrahedron that is it is linked to four other carbon atoms one here second third and let's say fourth and this gives rise to a rigid three-dimensional structure now if you recall graphite in graphite each carbon atom was bonded to three more carbon atoms and there was a double bond whereas here in diamond each carbon atom is bonded to four more carbon atoms and all these carbon-carbon bond are single covalent bond. As the carbon atoms are very closely packed in space, diamond is therefore hard and dense. In fact, due to its hardness, diamond is used as a cutting tool for cutting marble, granite, glass, etc. Now, do you have a free electron in diamond just like graphite? No, because all four valence electrons of carbon are involved in bond formation. Therefore, diamond, unlike graphite, has no free electron and hence is a poor or bad conductor of electricity. Well, diamond not only can be mined from earth but manufactured in laboratories. Yes, you heard that correctly. Diamonds can be manufactured in laboratories and such diamonds are called as synthetic diamonds or artificial diamonds. These are some of the pictures of artificial diamond which are produced by so-called high-pressure, high-temperature techniques. These diamonds, although smaller, are visually so similar and identical to natural stones that only a gemologist with special equipment can tell the difference. If you happen to look at a natural diamond and a synthetic diamond, you won't be able to make out the difference, nor will I. Thus, we see that due to different arrangement of carbon atoms in their structures, or different structural arrangements, diamond and graphite show different physical properties even though they have the same chemical properties. Why do they have the same chemical properties? Because both of them are made up of only carbon. Here in this table, I have differentiated the two on the basis of few physical properties. We have just learned diamond has three-dimensional rigid structure which makes it hard. In fact, the hardest known natural substance whereas graphite has planar hexagonal layer where these layers can slip over one another making it soft and slippery perfect for its use as a lubricant. Diamond is transparent in nature whereas graphite is opaque. Diamond doesn't have any free electron and is therefore a poor conductor of electricity. Graphite has free electron and is a good conductor of electricity. Diamond has a very high density of the order 3.5 gram per cubic centimeter whereas graphite has relatively lower density somewhere between this range. Moving on to a fairly recently discovered allotrope of carbon, an entire class of molecules known as fullerenes. C60 is one of the first known, well-researched, the most useful and famous fullerene made up of 60 carbon atoms arranged in a sphere as shown here. Scientists Kroto, Smalley, Curl and their colleagues from Rice University discovered C60 in the year 1985. These three scientists were awarded Nobel Prize for the same in the year 1996. Chemically, fullerenes are formed by the combination of large number of carbon atoms with formula CN where N stands for 
number of carbon atoms so when we write c60 the number of carbon atoms are 60 fullerenes may be hollow spheres just like c60 ellipsoids like c70 you can see in this figure they can be tubes known as bucket tubes or nanotubes or many other shapes and sizes as per your current syllabus you need to know only the most famous member after whom the entire family is named c60 c60 is also called as Buckminster Fullerene or Buckyball. Well, Buckminster Fullerene is itself named after the American visionary architect Richard Buckminster Fuller. This is because the structure of C60 shows close similarity to the geodesic domes designed and popularized by Richard Buckminster Fuller. Here, a new word that I've used is geodesic domes. Here the word geodesic in simple terms for your level means a structure or a building shaped like half a ball and which is made up of many parts that form triangles or any other shapes with several sides. You can see here the Montreal Biosphere. This was designed by Buckminster Fuller. Don't worry, this was all for your additional knowledge. Now let us look at the shape of C60. Now this model of C60 shows that there are 60 carbon atoms. You will not be able to see all, but there are 60 carbon atoms arranged in a sphere. You'll also see that it has hexagons and pentagons. You can also see that it resembles a football or a soccer ball. Here in this ball, you have black color pentagons and the white hexagon. Similarly, the structure of Buckminster Fullerene is made up of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. And because it resembles the soccer ball or the football, it is informally called as the Bucky Ball. Bucky in honor of the name of the architect and ball because it resembles football or the soccer ball. You might be surprised to know that fullerenes have also been found to be present in the suit that gets deposited in the chimney and also in the candle flame. You will be studying more about fullerenes, diamond, graphite and other allotropic forms of carbon in your higher classes. From whatever we have learned in this video, the things that you need to remember and be able to answer for your boards are direct questions such as what are allotropes, name three crystalline allotropes of carbon, why graphite is used as a lubricant, why graphite is a good conductor of electricity whereas diamond a poor conductor of electricity or why buckyballs are so called. I am sure after going through this video, you are in a position to answer these direct questions. Let us take up a few indirect questions from the topic. For example, if a question comes, diamond and graphite are allotropic forms of the same element. You know that the same element is carbon, but they differ in their characteristics. How will you account for this? You're going to account for this on the basis of the difference in their structures. So that part you can explain. Let's move on to the next question. The question says, a boy sharpens a pencil at both ends. So if we have a pencil, according to the question, the boy is sharpening the pencil from both sides at both ends and then uses its black end. So this is going to be the black end if you sharpen a pencil to complete the electric circuit. Will the current flow through the electric circuit? Give reason for your answer. Name the black substance of the pencil. If you remember, I've shown you a figure like this a little while ago when I was talking about the uses of graphite as electrodes. So here we are having just one pencil, the same thing we have shown with two pencils. So he's completing the electric circuit. Will the current flow through the electric current? The answer should be yes, because graphite has free electrons and therefore it is a good conductor of electricity. So that will be the reason for your answer. Name the black substance of the pencil. The black substance is graphite. Remember students, allotrope of carbon is not a very important topic. So you need not go into finer details of it and spend a lot of time on it. You have just few selected kind of questions, just prepare them well and you should be good to answer all the questions that come in your board or your internal examination from this topic. With this suggestion, I come to the end of this video. In my next video, we'll learn about the versatile nature of carbon. So my dear students, stay tuned to my channel. Do please spare a moment to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to share it with anyone who you feel might benefit. Do follow social distancing, but stay bonded, my dear learners.